Hello! This will be the first of our two lessons on hashing. Now, why do we care about hashing? And this will see a data structure called hash tables. Well, we have this map abstract data type that stores some number of key value pairs of this associated data. And as we've seen, unfortunately, whether we use a linked list or an array, whether we sort, sort it or not, we can't get better than linear performance for the map ADT operations that we care about, like putting a key value pair into the map or removing a key value pair. And this is because we had, in order to ensure the uniqueness of keys in our map, that we would only ever have one association for a particular key, we had to check all the keys in our map in order to make any of these operations happen. Now, as a teaser for a topic we'll get into after midterm break, using something called a balanced tree, we can get logarithmic performance for these operations, and there are situations where this will be exactly what we want. But today we're going to talk about a magic array that can do constant time for all of our map abstract data type operations. So what is this magic that uh, this array will have? Well, there are kind of three parts to this. First, we're going to remove the requirement that elements are ordered. What this means is that when we had a linked list or an array, there's always been an element at a particular index. We can say which is the first element in the list, which is the last element. If we iterate over the elements, we go through them in a predictable order from start to finish. And we're going to remove that aspect of the data structure when we talk about hash tables and that there's going to be no such thing as the first element or the last element. So that's the easy part. Uh, we're also going to use the key of our key value pairs to compute an array index where that key value pair will be stored in constant time. And this is going to be our main, one of our main focuses, uh, is this process of hashing, which is taking, turning this key into an array index. And this is going to be doable. The real sort of magic, more art than science, is how do you have a different index for every item, the, every key value pair that we want to store in the hash table? And I'll talk some about this, uh, but you'll see that it, there's no sort of simple rule that, that will give you this. All right, but let's talk about this turning a key into an array index. So our aim, as I said, is to get constant time put, get, contains, and remove for our map ADT. And we're going to indeed get constant time, but this is going to be kind of on average under usually reasonable assumptions in the same way that when we talked about uh, the array list, the extensible array, adding to the end of an array list is constant time on average, even though sometimes we have to extend the internal array. And hash tables will work in a similar fashion. And like our array list, it's going to have a fixed size Java array uh, holding its internal data. And the basic idea is that we have kind of the space of all possible keys. This is often called the key space. Um, and that might be integers in the database for the volunteers from my campaign for governor. Those will be uh, strings, right, the volunteer names. And we're going to have something called a hash function, which will take our key, take the name of the volunteer, and turn it into an index in our fixed array, our internal array. And so we'll take the key for our key value pair, and we're going to apply some function that's going to turn it into an index between zero and the table size minus one, just the kind of normal indexes we would have for an array. And one of the properties that we're going to assume here is that there are m possible keys, uh, where m is typically very large, even infinite, uh, but we expect our table to only have uh, some finite number n items uh, in it. And we're going to assume that n is much less than m, uh, and this kind of is often written in notation with two, two less than signs. And so if our key space is all possible strings, right, all the different strings that might be volunteer names, 
then are we're going to assume that only a small subset of all possible names are going to end up in our hash table. And this is quite common when we're dealing with maps. For example, uh, a compiler or like your PostScript interpreter, there are all possible strings which you could define to have some value uh, versus just those that are used in a particular PostScript program. Going to my Bower for Minnesota database, we have the key space of all possible volunteer names versus the volunteers who are actually signed up. AI is another example, all possible chessboard configurations versus those considered by the current player. And there are many other such examples. The key takeaway here is that if we have a set of possible keys, we're going to assume that only a small fraction of them uh, will actually be stored in our table at any one time. All right, so I said we have this function that's going to turn our key into uh, an array index. So let's dig into how that's actually going to work. An ideal hash function, if we could just uh, wave a magic wand and, and bring this function uh, h into existence, it's going to be fast, uh, and it's going to rarely put two keys that we're storing into the same index in the table. This second property is often kind of impossible in theory. You can never completely rule out the possibility that two keys end up hashed, end up being turned by this function into the same index. But in practice, this is pretty straightforward to achieve. However, we will need a strategy for handling what are called hash collisions, meaning that two different keys end up being put at the same index in this table according to this hash function. And Friday's lesson will be uh, largely about how do we handle these collisions. But let's make this concrete with a specific example. So our key space here will be integers, and we're going to go with a simple hash function where we're going to take our integer key and just mod it by the table size. So there are currently 10 spots in this table, and we're going to just take whatever our key is, it's going to be some integer, and mod it by the table size, and that's going to be the index into our table. And this mod by table size, it's fairly fast, it's a natural way to turn any number into a valid uh, index in this table, and this will frequently be part of, of anything that produces an index in an array is modding it by the size of the array to ensure that it's in that range. So for this particular example, table size is 10, and we're going to insert these five integers, 7, 18, 41, 34, and 10. Now, when we've talked about the map ADT, uh, it's been associations, right? It's been key value pairs. And in this example, we're only looking at the keys and we're ignoring the values. We're going to kind of imagine this is just data that's along for the ride. And since it's the key that's determining where we store a particular key value pair, uh, we're just going to assume that the value kind of follows the key along. And we're not going to worry too much about uh, how that's actually stored. So when we insert 7, uh, we need to apply our hash function in order to turn that key into the index in the table. And we do 7 mod 10. Well, that's just 7, and we insert it there. Now we insert the key 18, 18 mod 10, right? 18 divided by 10, then the remainder. That's going to give us 8. And so we'll insert 18 at index 8. Then we come to 41, 41 mod 10, we get rid of 40, we have one left over, and we insert 41 there. With 34, 34 mod 10 is 4, and 10 mod 10 is 0. So for each of these keys, we applied our hash function that gave us the index in our array where we would insert that key. And now it may become apparent why we had to uh, remove that restriction or that requirement that the items in our data structure be ordered, that we could say there's a first and a last, because even though we inserted, uh, even, even though we, we put 7 and 18 and then 41 in our table, this hash function is going to distribute them sort of 
at arbitrary points, that there's no point in this array where you can say, all right, this is uh, where the first thing put in the hash table would go, regardless of what it is. That's not how a hash function works. The where the key gets put in the table depends on the value of the key. And so we can still iterate over the values in this array, but the order is just sort of dependent on how the hash function worked out and, and, and where it put them. So it's important that we not require them to be in a kind of predictable uh, order when we insert them. So you may be asking, all right, there's this hash function, and see how it turns uh, a, an integer key into the, the, an index in our hash table. But who is hashing what? Am, am I the programmer writing this hash function? Is this something Java does? How does this break down? So our hash tables, like the other data structures we've looked at, are going to be generic. So they're going to be able to st store any element of type E. And the only thing that they require about E is that it is hashable, meaning that you can convert E, any particular value of this type E, to an integer, because it needs to be an integer in order to be an index into our array. And when hash tables are a reusable library, as they are in Java, Java provides uh, uh, various hashing-related data structures, uh, the division of responsibility kind of breaks down into two parts. We have uh, the client, that's like you and I writing code that uses Java's hash table, and then Java's hash table code in the Java library handles another part. So here's how it breaks down. The client will have to turn objects that they're storing in the table into integers, and then it's the hash table that takes those integers and turns them into an actual index in the table. Uh, so it's the hash table library that would be doing the mod table size that we saw in the previous example, as well as handling the case, as we'll talk in depth about on Friday, of if there are two, uh, two items, that, two keys that end up at the same index in the table. And so we're going to learn both of these roles, the client and the hash table library, but kind of most programming that you might do in the real world uh, is going to be on this client side for the simple reason that hash tables are frequently implemented as part of a programming language library. So you need to understand what the hash table is doing, uh, but this client side is, is what you might actually need to write yourself. And uh, in this lesson, we'll focus on kind of going from object all the way to table, table index, and then on Friday, all about this collision stuff. There's some ambiguity on terminology in terms of like what is hashing, and this has already sort of come up in the way I've talked about it. Is this uh, taking an object and turning it into an integer? Is that hashing? Uh, do you need the additional step of going to a table index to be hashing? And it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, it should be clear from, from context what, what we're talking about. Uh, but both of these roles need to try and minimize the number of times uh, that two keys might end up at the same table index. Specifically, the client side should aim for different objects to generate different ints. That's going to help get different keys to different uh, indexes in the table. And this library side should uh, aim to put ints that are uh, similar into different indices. And this sort of conversion from any int to a specific table index, as I said, it's almost always mod table size. Um, and uh, as I'll talk a little bit more about on Friday, using prime numbers for the table size is common because it can uh, help reduce the number of times that, that ints end up uh, colliding and, and being put at the same index. All right, but what about keys that aren't ints? Right? I've only so far talked about, uh, shown an example of how we could have take integer keys and mod them by the table size to get an index in our table. Um, well, as I said about the client's responsibility, if the keys aren't ints, then the client needs to convert them into an int. 
But there's a trade-off here in terms of there may be a very fast way of generating an int from an object that does a very poor job of generating different ints of distinct integers uh, for distinct keys. So let's take strings. Seems an important example. We're very often going to see a string as the, the keys for our hash table, as, as we've already seen in, in Monday's topic. And the space of possible keys is uh, all strings. And all strings are going to be uh, some sequence of characters, uh, character 0, character 1, character 2, etc., up to, to however long a string is. And each of these characters is a char in Java. And chars in Java are actually integers between 0 and 2 to the 16th minus 1, which is 65,535. And uh, we have different choices for how we might uh, turn a string into an integer. Uh, so you, that depends on the characters in that string. Uh, we might say, well, let's do something really fast. Let's just take the first character of the string uh, and mod it by the table size, and that's how we get our index. Um, very fast, uh, but that would be exceedingly poor at giving us different ints for different strings, right? That everything that started with the character A would end up being hashed to the same index. So that we don't want. It's a good rule, good rule of thumb to incorporate as much of the data of an object as we can when we are designing a hash function for it. So we might add up all the characters in a string, get some uh, larger integers, the sum of all those characters, and then take that mod table size. Uh, so this is taking a little longer, but we'd have more variation among the, the ints that we get for different strings, uh, but this has the downside of that strings with the same characters, uh, but in different orders, would actually result in the same uh, in the same int, that ABC and CBA, those, the sums of those characters would actually be the same, the order doesn't matter. Uh, so this number two option is, is not great either. So you probably act actually want something that looks like number three here, where we are summing up the characters, but each character is multiplied by a different factor. So the first character is multiplied by one. Right? I've omitted it here, multiplying by one doesn't change it. Uh, the second character times 31, the third character times 31 squared, fourth character times 31 cubed, all the way up to the last character times 31 to, to some power. And I'll actually demonstrate in a moment that this is what Java does, uh, because this has the nice effect of both incorporating all the characters that are in the string and incorporating information about the order that they're in, because each character is multiplied by a factor that depends on where it is in the string. And like the others, we're going to take mod table size to turn this integer or whatever it is into an actual table index. Uh, but this has, this has the nice property of uh, making it pretty unlikely that two different strings uh, produce the same, the same number. Uh, we might also sometimes think about specializing our hash functions. So maybe instead of a hash function for all possible strings, we just want to make a hash function for a particular kind of string, say uh, web addresses or, or URLs. Then uh, we might notice that URLs have a lot of uh, kind of shared characters, HTTP, colon, slashes, uh, that don't carry any useful information about uh, what is different between, between web addresses. Uh, and so we might actually take different parts of the string uh, and, and handle those differently, maybe kind of uh, generating some number for each part of the web address and then combining those. Uh, in order to, to specialize this hash function such that different web addresses can efficiently be turned uh, into distinct integers. So I wanted to jump to VS Code real quick to demonstrate how Java turns strings into integers as part of this hashing process. You might notice that this is a calendar date.java, which we'll return to shortly, uh, but I just wanted to look at this main method where I'm printing out uh, the hash of uh, several different strings. Now, all objects in Java have this hash code method, which is responsible for turning that object into an integer as part of this hashing process. And 
here I'm printing out the hash code for the string A, AA, and AAA. And so if I run this code, I will see that it prints out 97, uh, 3104, and 96,321. And we might wonder uh, where are these numbers coming from? And we want to ask, is this actually based on the characters uh, that are in these strings? So I happen to know that the character A is uh, value 97 in Java, and so when we print out the hash code for the string of just A, that's 97, so that suggests that it is related to the fact that this is the character A. Uh, and we can uh, try, well, for this two A's, uh, is it doing 97 plus 97 times 31? And for the three A's, is it doing 97 plus 97 times 31 plus 97 times 31 squared. And if I run these, see in fact, yes, uh, the hash code for two A's uh, matches uh, the, the formula that I had on the slide. So this is good evidence that uh, Java's hash code implementation is using the value of these characters and multiplying by this uh, factor of 31. Uh, it turns out that uh, the particular strings I chose for this example uh, that are all A's uh, are actually make it a little ambiguous exactly what this format is. Uh, and VS Code is handy enough to pop up documentation uh, for the string hash code method that shows that in fact it's the other way around, the biggest factor of 31 is on the first character of the string, and it's the last character that is just multiplied by 1. But it's the same idea of we're summing up all the characters, but multiplying them by different factors uh, in order to capture information about the order of the characters as well. So there's one critical detail that I want to emphasize when it comes to hashing and hash tables, is that the only step that I've talked about so far is that we have a key we apply a hash function and eventually we get a table index and, and that's, that's where we're, we're, we're storing it or that's where we're uh, retrieving it. But we actually need to confirm that the index that we generate with this hash function has the key that we're actually looking for. And so we're going to need to check if the key that we just hashed equals the key that stored at that index. And this means that the hash table needs both a hash function, a way to turn uh, keys into integers, and a way to compare keys. Uh, and Java, as it is wont to do, uses an object-oriented approach, which is to say that all objects in Java, as I said, have a hash code method that returns an int, and they also all have an equals method that takes some other object and returns true or false as to whether this object equals this other object. And the consequence of this is that equal objects must hash to the same integer. Uh, and this is an assumption that Java makes uh, about all objects that uh, you give to its, its hashing data structures. And this extends beyond Java as well, where keys that hash to the same integer must be equivalent. Uh, and a kind of Java-like way of saying that is if A equals B, if a dot equals b returns true, then it must be the case that the integer returned by a uh, dot hash code is the same as the integer returned by b dot hash code. So if two strings uh, have the same characters, uh, which would mean that they are, are equal using the equals method, then they, then they ought to have exactly the same hash code. So why is this essential? Um, it's necessary for correct hash table behavior. Uh, that, as I've said, it's possible for two keys to end up uh, hashing to the same table index. And when that happens, and we need a way to distinguish that situation from when it's simply a key that has been previously inserted into the table. And so as I'll demonstrate, uh, Java's hashing does not behave correctly unless this is true, that equal objects have the same hash code. 
And why is this the client's responsibility? Uh, it's because this hash code and equals method both depend on private fields of the object. So all objects have this equals and hash code method, but for it to work correctly on your own objects that you've created, that's going to depend on the specific fields of that object. So if you define a new object, Java doesn't know what automatically what makes two of those objects equivalent. You have to define that by making an equals method. Similarly, it doesn't know how to hash the objects in a way that's consistent with what makes objects equals, and so you have to define that as well. And so any object that overrides hash code, that replaces the default hash code that all Java, Java objects have, uh, must also replace equals. It must also implement an equals method in order to ma maintain this consistent relationship. So let's head back to calendardate.java in VS Code. All right, so this is the calendar date object that we saw uh, when talking about making objects comparable in Java. We have uh, a month and a day, uh, a constructor, and in a previous lesson we implemented a compare to method in order to compare a calendar, one calendar date with another. And for this, I've also implemented a handy to string method that just will return the month slash the day. Let's comment out this testing code from before and take a look at how uh, calendar dates are going to interact with hashing. So note that I have not implemented a hash code nor an equals method here. So we're going to look at what is the default behavior of these methods. So. I've created a January 31st date, an April 1st date, and an April 5th date. And I will check, all right, April 5th, my variable April 5, does it equal April 5? Uh, I hope that's true. A variable should equal itself. Um, more interesting is, does April 5 equal some new calendar date that has the same data inside of it that also represents April 5th? So let's take a look. Well, the first thing printed out is true. Uh, so April 5 does equal April 5. Uh, but it's false that April 5 equals this other calendar date uh, that also has a month of April and a day of the 5th. Uh, and so this uh, highlights why implementing your own equals method uh, is important because the default behavior is only checking are these literally the same object. The, the default equals method in Java doesn't know that it needs to compare the month and the day uh, in order to do this, uh, do this correctly. Let's also look at uh, the hash codes uh, for uh, these different calendar date methods, hash code, all objects have it, so we can call it uh, and get the sort of default behavior. And we see that there are these large integer values. Uh, it's not clear what their relationship is to anything about the object. It's uh, related to some internal state of the Java virtual machine when that uh, object is created. Uh, and that's sort of the default behavior just to be able to turn uh, objects into integers for hashing. And note that my April 5 object has a different hash code than when I create a new uh, April 5 object. And not only is this uh, default hash code using some inscrutable internal state of the Java virtual machine, it's actually dependent on when the hash code method is first called. For example, we see that the first hash code printed out, the one for January 31st, uh, is uh, 10203 and so on. And let's say that I reorder these uh, calls to hash code and instead first print out the hash code of this new April 5th calendar date object. It turns out that this does not actually change the order of things printed out because this hash code that begins 10203 is the hash code for whatever calendar date object had hash code called on it first. 
in this program. And it doesn't actually relate to which object that was at all. Uh, and so if we want sort of sensible behavior from hash code, we generally need to implement it for the objects that we're hashing. So let me show concretely how this interferes with the behavior of hashing in Java. So I'm going to create something called a hash set. And we've been talking about maps that have these key value pairs and that the keys must be unique. A set is like a map, except instead of pairs, it's just the keys. So a set is a collection of unique keys. Uh, and that's all it is, no associated values. So uh, a hash set uses the same hashing idea. It's just not storing associated values. So I'm going to create a set of calendar dates. I'm going to add April 5 to it. I'm going to print out, does the set contain April 5? I'm going to add a new calendar date that has the same information as April 5, month 4, day 5. Uh, print out whether the set contains uh, yet another new uh, calendar date that is um, uh, April 5th, and then print out the set so that we can see it. When I run this program, I see that after it prints out these hash codes, uh, it prints out true, that the April 5 that I added to the set is contained in there. Uh, I add this one, and then set contains new calendar date. That is false. Uh, again, because these will have different different hash codes. Uh, and when I print out this set, I see there are two April 5ths in there. So even though the keys are supposed to be unique, uh, they're not in this case because objects that uh, calendar dates that are the same are getting different hash codes. So let's let's set this right. Let's uh, let's implement a hash code method and. Uh, I'll just apply a similar principle to what we saw that strings do do in Java. I'm going to return um, uh, my month times 31 plus my day uh, times 31 times 31. And uh, that will be the, the hash code integer for my uh, uh, for my calendar dates. Uh, so let's fire this up, see. Uh, what's happening. Uh, so we now see that the hash code for uh, April 5th here, 4929, is the same as my April 5th uh, variable, 4929, where they were different before. So that's good. Uh, we now have uh, equivalent uh, calendar date objects with the same month and day, generate the same integer for the hash code. Uh, but the hash set is not behaving any better. Um, we still end up with two uh, April 5ths in a set that's supposed to uh, contain only unique keys. And that's because of exactly the phenomena I was talking about, where Java is using dot equals in order to check, is this new key we're adding actually equivalent to the previous key? Because if it hashes the same, which it does, but it's not equivalent the hash set will treat them as if they are different uh, different keys. And so we currently have this sort of bad behavior where we've uh, implemented hash code but not implemented uh, an equals. So let's do that now. And the first thing that we do in any equals method is check whether this other object is even the same class as the one that we're comparing to. Because if they're different classes, then uh, we can't exactly compare their fields because they're going to have different fields. Uh, so we can say, uh, does the class of this other object uh, equal uh, the class, the calendar date class? And this is sort of the uh, verbose syntax that that you use in Java to add to get the class of some object uh, and then compare it to a particular particular class. Um, but if the classes are equal, uh, then we can, then we know that they're both uh, both calendar dates, and I'll create a calendar date uh, variable and cast my other object to it. Uh, and then return just whether their uh, months are equal to my month and 
that their day is equal to uh, the day of this object. Uh, otherwise, if they're different classes, uh, then we know they're not equal and can just return false. Uh, so with this equals method in place, we can now uh, run our main method and find that, look, we added an April 5th, and we added another April 5th, and then we asked it to set contain this new April 5th, uh, and that was true, and when we print out the set, it only has one April 5th, because it now can tell that these the, the two calendar dates are in fact equivalent, and a set that contains only unique keys would not have both. But we do need both equals and hash code to do this, that if I comment out hash code and just have equals, the behavior of our hash set returns to incorrectly handling uh, these values with the same data because uh, they have different hash codes. So they don't ever actually get compared uh, with equals. Uh, and so this is why for your own objects, when it's something that is going to be put into a hash set or a hash map, uh, it needs to implement both hash code and equals. So to conclude, uh, a hash table is one of the most important data structures uh, in computer science. And because it relies on this efficient hash function to turn keys into table indexes, it can do contains, put, get, and remove all the operations of our math ADT in constant time. Because we can access an element in an array given an index in constant time, and we have a function that can turn an object into an integer in constant time. And remember that in our implementation of the map that was using a list, it was the iterating through the list to find out if there was a matching key that was slow, that made it all linear time. And if we can just apply the hash function, get a table index, well, that's where we look. We don't have to do a, a linear search through our, our list in order to see if there's a matching key. If there is a matching key, it will be the index that we get from the hash function. And to repeat, we can iterate over the keys uh, and or values in our table, but they're not guaranteed to be any in any particular order. That They're going to end up in different points in our array based on uh, the, re the, the results of their hash function. And when we iterate over them, it's we're not going to necessarily get first, the first thing that was put into the map. So uh, that kind of nice property of, of the other structures that we've studied uh, no longer holds when we're talking about hashing. Um, it's also important to use a good hash function. If, you, uh, if your hash function uh, returns the same integer for a lot of different keys, the assumptions that we're making uh, to, to claim that contains put, get, and remove are constant time aren't going to hold. And uh, a lot more about that on Friday. Bit of a side note, hash functions have uh, a number of uses beyond hash tables. Uh, they come up in cryptography. Uh, they come up in something called checksums, which is a way to verify that a file you downloaded uh, is actually the file that you meant to download and hasn't had kind of nefarious uh, things or, or uh, inserted in it or otherwise been, been messed with. And the big topic that we'll, we'll talk about next is how do we handle when two keys hash to the same index. Uh, with that, I look forward to your questions, and I'll see some of you in the learning block.